title of the message is Be Filled with Joy. Be Filled with Joy. So we'll start out by reading Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 26, uh, which is the fruits of the Spirit. And then we're going to turn over to Acts chapter 13, verse 42 to 52. chapter 5, verse 22 to 26, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. All right, turn over to Acts chapter 13. Uh, you don't have to hold your place in Galatians. Um, we just did that to look at the fruits of the Spirit. But Acts chapter 13, verse 42 to 52. chapter 13, verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Well, it is such a blessing to be back in church, to be meeting in person after over two months a long time. And it hasn't been easy because the coronavirus forced us to rethink the way that we do church. Um, for me, videoing sermons in my office uh, for people to watch online was hard because I don't like being in front of a, a camera. Plus, I, I don't have the interaction with you as I'm, as I'm preaching, um, preaching to you and, and can see you. Um, for most of you, I'm sure it wasn't easy having to stay home and to not come to fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then on top of that, watching the sermons on the TV um, or the computer, that's not the same as hearing it in person. For me, it was also hard because I couldn't come uh, to visit with you at your homes and um, you know, talking on the phone or on the computer, it's not the same as getting to visit in person. So now we're back together, but things still aren't back to normal because we've had to change things around. The sanctuary, it's going to be a little while before we can have uh, potlucks and um, fellowship times uh, and then different other changes. But through all of this, Bering Baptist Church has remained faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, all of you have remained faithful to Him. And by being here this morning, you're continuing to show your faithfulness to Him. 
So thankfully through all of this, God has been faithful, and he'll continue to be faithful as he is always faithful. Absolutely nothing will ever change that. So today I'd like for us to take a look at one of the fruits of the Spirit, which is joy. And the reason I like to talk about joy is because it really is a joyous occasion to be back in church after such a long time. Not only that, but any time that we come together as a family to worship God, it is a joyous occasion. When I was a kid, my mother and her friend, Esther Bandy, uh, they started a Good News Club together. And I'll never forget all the things that I learned from Good News Club, uh, part of Child Evangelism Fellowship. We learned Bible verses and stories, and we watched puppet shows, and we learned uh, a lot of great songs. And one of those songs that I'll never forget is, uh, I've got the joy down in my heart. Um, it's got a great catchy little tune, and when we sang it, we clapped our hands, and there was no way to sing the song without smiling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step away from my notes for a second here and see if the kids might want to sing that for us. I've got the joy down in my heart. Do you kids know that song? Yeah. All right. But you guys just want to stay in your seats, but... Uh, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. synagogues 
to preach the gospel. And that's just what they did here. As they're leaving the synagogue, we're told that the Gentiles begged for them to preach their message to them on the next Sabbath. And I think that this, in and of itself, is enough to bring joy to any believer's heart because they're coming to Paul and Barnabas and they're asking for the gospel to be preached. Can you imagine if we were to walk out the doors of the church this morning and be met by a crowd of people outside who but we we're begging us to tell them all about Jesus. I'm pretty sure that would bring joy to our hearts. And I'd sit back here and smile and I'd let all of you share the love of Jesus with them. Uh, so Paul and Barnabas must have been excited at this point because their service for the Lord was bearing fruit. And, and none of it, absolutely none of it was in vain. Well, after Paul and Barnabas agree to do it, they then go their separate ways. But there's still a group who wants more. A group of Jews and proselytes. Proselytes were the Gentiles and the non-Jews who believed in the God of Israel and they were now practicing the Jewish faith. Well, why would they want to know more? If you think about it for a minute, the Jewish laws were very strict. You know, no person could keep them perfectly in their entirety except for Jesus. And on top of that, the Jewish religious leaders added a bunch of man-made rules. So now Paul and Barnabas are preaching about the grace of God and how Jesus kept the law perfectly sinless and then died in our place. And so we're talking about a huge burden being lifted off of your shoulders. You know, the, the burden of sin and the burden of works. So, of course, this group, the proselytes, they're serious, devout Jews and, and proselytes who they wanted to hear more. You know, the gospel, it's an exciting message to proclaim because it brings joy to our hearts. And that's what I see happening here. And I think it's interesting that Paul tells them to continue in the grace of God. Why would he say that? Well, I believe that's because they were so attached to Judaism and to the law that they needed time to let this newfound grace sink in. You know, when a, when a person gets saved, there's always that temptation to go back to the way that we were living before we got saved. And in this case, these men and women, they would have gone back to following their list of rules, and they would have been turning their faith into legalism. But no, the, the gospel and the grace of that Jesus Christ brings, that is something that brings joy to the hearts of believers. It's something for us to be excited about, to have joy about. And I believe that this joy must have been abounding in them and have been displayed for all their neighbors to see. Because in verse 44, we're told that almost the whole city came to hear the word of God. So these people, they're curious. They recognize that something good has happened in the lives of these believers. And they want to know more. But this joy in their hearts, it wasn't just isolated to their group. We're told in scripture that the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. So we know that the angels were rejoicing on this day. We're also told in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news and announce it to the world. And when I read that, you know, I picture the messenger walking in with a little skip in their steps, rejoicing at the opportunity to share the good news. All of us have hopefully had that opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. It feels good. It's exciting to get to do that, isn't it? And that's how we see Paul and Barnabas. Uh, they're rejoicing at the privilege to bring the gospel to these people. Well, what about you and me? Do we take joy in serving the Lord? Just think about it. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest message that this world will ever hear. It's beautiful. It's pure. It's strong. It's delightful. It's delightful. 
So while we have the opportunity to talk about it with others, we should have joy. And when a person turns to Christ, it's something that we should be jumping up and down on the inside with because another soul has turned to Jesus. And even if God sends us to the jungles of South America uh, to reach a tribe in the middle of nowhere, we can do so joyfully because God has sent us to them. Or even if he sends us to the poorest part of, say, New York City, where there's homeless people everywhere, it's very dangerous, we can go with joy because God has sent yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Paul and Barnabas knew that God was sending them all over the world. And they knew that it wasn't going to be easy. They knew that they were going to have to sacrifice everything in order to serve the Lord. But they did it joyfully because they had a message, a good news, a joy to bring to the world. Now let's bring it home uh, a little closer now. God might, call you to, God might call you to reach an alcoholic or you know, he might call you to reach out to a, a drug addict or someone that's just fresh out of prison he might call you to reach out to one of the Indian reservations. And even if we go and nobody responds to the good news, we can still be full of joy because God is pleased with our obedience. And you know, you just, you just never know that the seeds that you plant might just grow someday. You might not see it, but God does. God is the one who gives the increase, not us. Second, you see, Paul showed joy through persecution. He had joy through persecution. Verse 45 of Acts chapter 13, verse 45 says, When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And then go down to verse 50. The Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. Well, any time that we're doing the Lord's work, Satan is not happy. His minions, the demons, usually get involved. You know, we can't see them, but they are there. And they, you know, try to discourage us or get people angry with us or uh, try to just throw us off track. And that's what we see happen here with Paul and Barnabas. There's a large crowd of people that's come to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And the enemy gets the Jewish zealots worked up. The message of the gospel is that Jesus died for all people. And these Jewish men here, they weren't happy that Paul and Barnabas were, uh, for one thing, preaching Jesus as the Messiah, because they didn't believe that he was. But for another, he was preaching salvation to the Gentiles. And they didn't like seeing Gentiles responding to God, giving their lives to him and becoming part of his family. It made them angry. Verse 45 actually tells us that they were filled with envy. But instead of walking away, they decided to blaspheme the name of God Almighty and to oppose Paul. Now, in reality, even though it says that they were opposing the things spoken by Paul, they were actually opposing God Almighty himself. Their Messiah, the Messiah Jesus, who they should have recognized, is using his messenger Paul to tell these people about him, to give them the good news. And so these zealots, they fight back. And in doing so, they were fighting against the very God who they claimed to worship. Paul and Barnabas knew this, and the Holy Spirit gave them the strength that they needed 
and the words to say in response to their enemies. Psalm chapter 5 verse 11 tells us, Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. And so no matter what the circumstances are that we are in, God is our protection. That's how Paul was able to boldly respond, You did hear the gospel first, as God promised it to the Jews first. And since you've rejected, rejected it, God is now turning to the Gentiles. Now, in order to understand how serious this statement is, we have to look at how the Jews viewed the Gentiles. Um, here are some statements from the Talmud, which uh, contains the Jewish civil and ceremonial law. It, it's the written down traditions of the Pharisees. So this is, these are some of the things that they had to say about Gentiles, non-Jews. Uh, the deeds of Israel are righteous, but the Gentiles are capable only of sin. Gentiles are inclined to bestiality, lewdness, and murder. Gentiles prefer sexual relations with cows more than their own wives. Eve had sexual intercourse with the serpent, transmitting lust to the Gentiles, from which the Israelites are exempt. God is displeased when Jews show hospitality to Gentiles. It is permissible to cheat a Gentile in court. A non-Jew is not considered a neighbor. Well, obviously not all Jews thought this way, but I share that with you because many of the Jewish leaders were teaching their people this kind of attitude, an attitude of superiority over the Gentiles, an attitude of hate towards non-Jews. We're better than you, and God would never love you, and the Messiah will come for us, not for you, and he's going to judge all of you. Well, the Jews, looking back on the Old Testament, were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, according to God, that's what he told them, be, be a light, but instead they looked down on the Gentiles. So here you can understand why this group of Jews are upset that Paul and Barnabas are teaching God loves you. And the Messiah came for you and died for you and will welcome you into his family. And regardless of whether these Jews believed Jesus to be the Messiah or not, that didn't matter. What they cared about was their traditions, which taught that the Messiah was coming for Israel. Now, the fact that Paul and Barnabas were giving these Gentiles hope, pointing them to the Messiah, that made these Jews very upset. So they blasphemed, which was all they could do because they didn't have any grounds to stand upon. And when they realized that Paul and Barnabas weren't backing down, they resorted to stirring up the city's leaders, the, uh, the prominent men and women. They knew that they weren't going to have any luck getting this crowd of Jews and Gentiles all worked up, but they could get the elite men and women of their city to kick Paul and Barnabas out, and that's exactly what they did. Kick them out for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. But do you think that Paul and Barnabas were discouraged? Well, of course not. It says that they, they shook the dust off their shoes, just like Jesus told his disciples to do when their message was rejected by the cities they visited. But I can picture Paul and Barnabas still walking away with a skip in their step, because their efforts were not in vain. You know, their, their preaching led to many of these men and women who heard the gospel, to many of them getting saved. And so they were willing to be persecuted, even if it meant only one soul came to Christ. And there was more than one, there were several there. Obviously, nobody goes searching for persecution. But when it comes, how are believers able to face it? Well, if you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll look at verse 6 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. 
6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, but the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then in the book of James, he tells us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, because we know that the testing of our faith produces patience. So just like Paul and Barnabas kept their joy through, through persecution, you and I can as well. We, we know that the Holy Spirit is with us through any of the trials that we face. And the joy that he gives us is something wonderful. Lastly, the <coughs> Apostle Paul showed, showed joy through belief. Joy through belief. Uh, verse 48 of Acts chapter 13. Verse 48 when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. Uh, verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. There was a Russian countess who accepted the Lord Jesus as her Savior. And she was open about her testimony. And the, the Tsar was displeased, and he threw her into prison. After 24 hours with the lowest level of Russian society, and the most miserable conditions imaginable, he ordered her brought into his presence. He smiled, and he said, Well, are you ready now to renounce your silly faith and come back to the pleasures of the court? To his surprise, the Countess smiled serenely and said, I have known more real joy and more real happiness in one day in prison with Jesus than I have known in a lifetime in the courts of the Tsar. So she found true joy and happiness in Jesus Christ because of her belief in him. And here in Acts, these Gentiles understood that they were outsiders and they had no part of the blessings of the Jewish people. And the only way they could have any hope before Jesus came was to become a proselyte, to commit themselves to follow the law, to be circumcised, to turn away from their old lives. And the problem was that that required a lot from the person. The law of Moses was not an easy thing to follow. And that's why they had sacrifices to cover over their sins. Uh, none of the Jews could keep the law perfectly in its entirety. And uh, the Gentiles couldn't either. So a lot of Gentiles chose not to convert to Judaism because it was just too much work. But now they're being told that salvation is open to them and all they have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them. So there's no earning salvation. The message Paul and Barnabas were preaching was received gladly by these Gentiles and I would even say enthusiastically. Joy flooded their souls because they knew that the, the truth that Jesus loved them. And what did they do with that joy? Well, they turned around and they worshiped the Lord. That's what verse 48 says. They glorified the word of the Lord. And so once again, I try to picture this in my mind as I read it. I can see these men and women smiling and hugging one another and jumping up and down, so excited that they now belong to the family of God, that they they now have the presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, in their hearts. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with your joy and your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 to 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls.
Salvation is always something for us to be joyful about. And these men and women, they then spread the good news all over the region. Jesus loves you. Salvation is open to everyone. Salvation is always something to be joyful about. So, how do we experience the joy of belief in our lives? Well, the answer is that we thank God every day for the salvation He's provided for us. You know, back uh, back when you got saved, you know, it was something to be excited about. You know, you were enthusiastic. Uh, you were full of joy. And that's not something that's supposed to go away. Sometimes we get used to being saved and just kind of go through the motions and we lose that joy. But it's not supposed to be gone. It's supposed to be continuing. We're part of the family of God. We're on our way to heaven. It's something to have joy about. And so, in closing, I'd like first to address those who have already given your lives to Jesus Christ. I'd ask the question, are you living with joy in your heart? Or are you depressed and discouraged and living as if there's no hope? Remember what Jesus has done for you. Remember the joy that comes from knowing him. And ask him to reignite that joy in your heart. And to start living with this fruit of the spirit. This joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Next I'd like to address those who don't belong to Jesus. Maybe watching on the video today. There's, there's a lot of hopelessness. There's a lot of sadness and discouragement in this world. Especially right now, isn't there? All the bad happening in our world. It's so easy to get down in the dumps and feel like there's no more joy in this world and no hope. But I'm here to tell you that you can have true joy, real joy, in your heart if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus loved the world so much that he gave his life on the cross. So that anyone who believes in him will, spend, will not spend an eternity in hell but we'll spend an eternity in heaven with Jesus. And the joy that he gives will be forever. Nothing will ever take that away. And so I would encourage you, if you've never made that decision, to turn to Jesus today. Let us pray. We love you so much, Almighty God. And we're so thankful for the joy that comes from knowing you. Lord, we just pray that you would keep that spark of joy, that fire inside of us, Lord, and ignite it. And Lord, as we go about our lives, may we be enthusiastic because we belong to you. It's exciting. And uh, Lord, we pray for those around us who don't know you, who don't have the joy that comes from you, Lord. Uh, we pray, God, that they would be open to hearing uh, about you. And Lord, they'd see your joy in us and that they would want it, Lord, and we'd come to know you. We love you so much, Lord. We're so grateful that you're our Savior. We're so grateful for all that you're doing in our heart. 